In 1992, Sitchin produced a documentary titled, Are We Alone in the Universe? At the end of that film, Sitchin quotes a NASA press release from that same year. Unexplained deviations in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune point to a large outer body system of four to eight Earth masses on a highly tilted orbit seven billion miles from the Sun. This NASA press release suggests that Harrington did find Planet X in 1991. But the truth will never be known, because before he could publish his findings, Harrington died from a rapid onset of esophageal cancer on January 23, 1993. With his New Zealand findings suppressed, and having died before he could publish his findings, many believe he was assassinated. One of the reasons given by those who subscribed to the theory of an assassination was an obituary by Charles E. Worley of the U.S. Naval Observatory. Worley wrote an obituary about Harrington that states, Late in his career, Bob seemed quite skeptical of such an object, however. It is important to note that no other sources have come forward to corroborate Worley's claim. Consequently, Harrington's mysterious death was a shot out of the dark that quickly silenced the Planet X topic, both with the mainstream media and science community alike. In a very real sense, it was a veiled threat. Tamper with this at the risk of your own career, or perhaps even your life. In this regard, Worley's obituary was highly effective. This is for sure. Nonetheless, there is a curious question. Harrington built a custom telescope for a U.S. Naval Observatory station in New Zealand. The mission was simple, to find Planet X. So then, did they? Who knows? Because until NASA decides to declassify Harrington's observations, all we can say is that where there is smoke, there is fire. Meanwhile, we're not helpless either, and you'll see why later on in this program. But for now, if you are beginning to feel that the time has come to begin your own planning and preparation for whatever may come, then know this. When the worst of it hits, it will not be brief. This will not be weeks or months. Rather, we're looking at several years, perhaps longer than a decade. What this means is that your supplies, no matter how much you have on hand, is nothing more than a buffer. It buys you some time to work something else out. To optimize that opportunity of time, gather knowledge now. Because after things run out, knowledge will help you to endure. And now, I'd like to share some of this very knowledge with you. It's something I've put a lot of work and love into because I know it will help people to make it to the backside. And that is what I'm all about. For those in preparation and planning, healthcare is always a problematic area because it is focused on the pills, potions, and supplements preppers set aside to help get themselves through a cataclysm. And it is problematic because all things physical play out, so a practical solution is what we call transition planning. So is this a December 21, 2012 solution? No. In our last video, Planet X System Observations and Orbital Path Analysis, we addressed December 21, 2012 as an awareness event. It was media driven and it was successful in creating awareness, so on that regard, Mission accomplished. Now, transition is the mission. Simply put, surviving the worst of times begins with surviving the best of times. So in this program, we want to introduce the core concept of transition planning. It is a four-stage survival resource rating system. Stage one is cataclysm awareness. 
This is when the mainstream media begins to seriously report the news to the public at large and panic buying ensues. If you're not prepared by this time, be ready for long lines and short supplies at the store. Stage two is cataclysm events. Simply put, the first to fall will most likely be the last to know. Planning and luck will also play equal roles. While planning and preparation is not a guarantee that you and your loved ones will survive these events, it will, however, dramatically increase your odds of survival. And with repeated events, expect all or part of your survival stores or caches to be exhausted, lost, or stolen. Stage three is post-event. Those who survive the cataclysm event will search for survivors and pull together into small, self-organized groups. While most preppers set aside enough for themselves and their loved ones, as a member of a larger survival group, you'll also share with them as well. This is when the bulk of your physical supplies will be used up. Stage four is the backside. This will be the time years into the future when those who survive all the worst that men and nature can throw at them live to see blue skies once again. By this time, all medical supplies will have long been exhausted and what you'll have is knowledge. Of paramount importance will be the kind of knowledge that helps you with survival wellness and developing sustainable ways of growing food and medicinal herbs. This brings us to the simple metric of our transition planning system. It's a rating system. You rate your resources, physical and knowledge, in terms of how far they'll get you through the process. Here are a few examples. The internet is a fabulous stage one resource, but it likely will not go much further than that. A fire extinguisher is a handy stage two resource. Have one on hand. And off-road bicycles will be an ideal stage three resource for getting around when there's not much left in the way of roads. And long after the internet, fire extinguishers and off-road bicycles have rusted away, knowledge will continue to endure, especially survival knowledge like Danjun breathing. Danjun breathing was created by Korean ruling elites back in the early days of acupuncture. These people were not worried about dying from hunger or thirst. Rather, they lived in fear of catching a cold, hence the old expression don't catch your death of cold. And to explain how it works is Dungeon Breathing for Wellness co-developer, Master Roar Shepherd. You want to have a tool that's been used for thousands of years to deal with these kind of situations. Dungeon Breathing is easy to learn, quickly oxidizes the body, lets go of carbon dioxide waste, and lowers the calorie demand of the body. More oxidation in the body, less influence from communicable diseases. Now that's important. The complete Donjon Breathing for Wellness system from feelbetteronyourown.com includes a full color symptoms handbook and six exercise and reference DVDs. This course was developed by preppers, for preppers, and the symptoms handbook is the core of the system. It offers quick access to poses for a wide range of symptoms and complaints. And it's designed to help volunteer trainers pass along these simple techniques to others. Each pose is cross-referenced by skill level, symptom, and personal goals. Organized into three levels, low impact, universal, and high impact, the 57 core poses offered in the Feel Better on Your Own system represent those used by Korean elites for centuries. They are simple, practical, and highly effective. To learn more, visit feelbetteronyourown.com today and view our free instruction videos.
Imagine that you knew about the stock market crash of 1929 well in advance of the common man. Obviously, you could use such advanced knowledge to reap windfall profits from the misery. That is, assuming you were to keep the knowledge a secret. So, to what lengths would you go to keep future victims in the dark so that you could achieve the full measure of your own self-interested goals? Likewise, would you expect elites to rise above their own compulsions for power and wealth for moral or ethical purposes to inform the public at large, even if you are not so inclined? The point here is that for the elites, the topic of Planet X has always been about the leverage of deception because of something I call Titanic rules. First class gets the boats and steerage goes down with the ship. We're steerage and the best we can do is to muster an occasional glimpse through a foggy porthole before the elites close it. Yes, it's unfair, but it has always been that way and each day you spend agonizing over this is one less day you're focused on what really matters, your survival and that of those for whom you love and care. Keep this in mind as we present excerpts from observation reports. On April 24, 2006, Yowza.com broke the story on the South Pole Telescope, SPT, in Antarctica. The stated mission for the SPT really doesn't make a lot of sense because the same science could be done somewhere else at a fraction of the cost. So why build an expensive and sophisticated infrared telescope in such an inhospitable and inaccessible location as the Admonson Scott South Pole Station in Antarctica? The answer is simple. This infrared 10 meter dish is the perfect instrument for observing an object rising up through the southern skies in infrared. And once they turned it on in January 2007, that's exactly what happened. 